Welcome to The Brain Dump, where we study the psychology of success. Join us as we probe the habits, rituals, and routines of top-performing artists, entrepreneurs, authors, athletes, and more to uncover the timeless principles we can all use to take our lives to the next level. Are you ready to plunge the grunge that's been gunking up your mind's eye? Great, then let's get to it. Guys, welcome back to the Brain Dump. We, you know, guys, Anthony, we so, have our number number one fan back, and she brought a friend. How exciting is this? That's what you call an ambassador. You know, oh, that's I like John right. number a one raving fan. fan. Raving fan and ambas- brand ambassador. <laughs> mm-hmm. The best marketing you'll ever do is if you can turn your ra- like your good fans into raving fans, because then they go out and they bring great people to you, like Monica. So now we have more it. people in our sphere because of so, because of so Julie. We we might actually steal this where uh, a guest has to bring on somebody. This is kind of cool because uh-huh. if you want to come uh, back, you have to bring somebody with you. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know Monica. I don't know Monica. This is the first time we're meeting. Anthony, do you know Monica? No. I, I, okay. I mean, we've we've communicated, but I would not say I know Monica. Perfect. Nope. So, Julie, you go introduce her and then tell us what we're talking about today. Okay, fantastic, and um, that's so exciting. Okay, Monica is uh, more than a friend, but we met through what I who the person I refer to affectionately as my financial Sherpa. His wife found unearthed Monica and I needed some help with my website. And so da 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 enter Monica into my life. And next thing you know, I'm like, here's this is like I need Monica in my life all the time. So I call I, I affectionately refer to Monica, who's also a friend at this point, like a dear friend, where I'm like, hey, I might be road tripping. You want to meet up? <laughs> and so and she's like, Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> True story. So anyhow, all that to say, so Monica is my friend and brand Sherpa. And um, she has also just been an absolute inspiration and light because um she's been involved in the book clubs that I have um been hosting, their five-week book clubs. You can learn more about those at Julie. Um, oh, wow. And so all this to say, she has a really powerful mind and insight and just brings so much. She has this quiet voice and it's been like so delightful. I've watched Monica just grow and evolve. So there's like all the like, th- there's a little bit of the girly feminine, feminine florally, like, oh, you know, but um, the reason I was like, guys, we have to have this conversation. And I initially pitched this as a just like, okay, Austin, Anthony, you need to tackle this conversation over on Brain Dump because it's so relevant. It's so essential for a lot of people to understand. And Monica and I were having our own side conversation on this topic as well. And I already know that all of our minds will mesh and just feed off of each other because we're not competitive. It's more like, oh, let's take this deeper and richer. So the concept today comes from the current book, which is uh, The Four Agreements by Don Miguel Ruiz. And um, the concept is from the agreement, always do your best. And I had this aha and the aha was always do your best you don't have to always be the best. And I was in a funk. We were talking about that a little bit offline. And um, I was in this funk. And then next thing you know, I'm reading this chapter and I just, just washed over me like, dang, comparison syndrome. And how do you battle that? So that's the topic is what's the difference between really semantics, two words, doing your best and being the best. I want to I want to share a story from this weekend. I was hanging out with uh, some friends on the lake, and they have little kids. And one of the little girls, her name is Aubrey. And <laughs> this is this was hilarious to me. Um, we were I think we we're playing cornhole, which is the game where you have like the bean bags and you throw them into the the board with the hole in it. And and afterwards, I was like, "So how did it go?" And she goes, "I I didn't win, but I did my best." And I was like, "Oh, that's a good little attitude you got there. I like that." <laughs> that's so cool hey you need to high five her parents for sure because how often do parents tell us okay you got to be the best you know if it's team Mm -hmm. sports if it's academics like whatever it is we're like programmed and conditioned to i've got to be the best Mm -hmm. the best But, but don't you think the bigger issue is defining what the best is for yourself 
Okay, so this is where this starts to get super juicy, right? Because, okay, so let's just define that right now. What is the best? Well, Austin, I'm going to start jumping in. Oh, sorry. No, go <laughs> no, ahead. Monica, you get in there. You go. I have a talent for cutting people off. I'm going to say that first thing. <laughs> the talent for starting when someone else's does. Um, this is something I wanted to break down. I'm so glad Julie jumped into it first thing because... First off, I struggle in defining and knowing what is my best because I always feel like I can do better. And that will push me off a cliff sometimes. But um, there is no the best. Maybe that's what I wanted to kind of end with. But I personally think there is no the best because it's a matter of opinion. No one can say this is the best band or this is the best president because it's all a matter of opinion. What's best for someone isn't going to be the best for me. So it's all in our own, our own definition, our own personal realm. Well, isn't that the bigger issue? And I keep going back to that comment Leland said is that there's too many people walking around living injected values of others. Mm. I mean, as a high achiever, as a business owner, as a creator of podcasts and content, the target always moves, right? Yeah. And so at the end of the day, half of the time that, and when I run into people, they don't even know what the best version of themselves is. They don't even know what the best practice is for their lifestyle. And so isn't it more about defining what matters to you? I mean, I'd be curious to hear Anthony's take on this because he's probably got some huge thoughts on that. No, all my thoughts are pretty small on this one because, well, <laughs> you're rolling your eyes. But never yeah. small. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, I, I come back to like always trying to quantify and measure things. I think a lot of us do that when it's like, okay, what is my best? Can you measure that based off of effort? Is that mis- measured off of output? Is that like, how can we measure this? That's like where our minds go to because you you want to be objectively the best, not just subjectively. I think that's the problem for a lot of like perfectionists is that like you look at it and you're like, this is good. It's, it's as good as I can make this, but is it objectively the best? No, there's always room for mm-hmm. improvement. And so to Austin's mm-hmm. question, like how do we define the best for ourselves is, is super difficult. And so maybe it starts with just having a bucket of, of values that you're you're measuring yourself against in some way. But I, I don't know, because as soon as you start getting into comparisonitis with yourself, your past self, or like your, your potential self, there's you're, you're living in a state of um, judgment. And that's not that's definitely not conducive for being at your best. If you're if you're leaking any kind of mental energy towards that, I'm reading Bruce Lee's striking thoughts right now. He's a bit of a philosopher mm-hmm. and he has some thoughts on this where it's like if uh, something about anxiety is only exists in the distance between now and then. So if you live in the now, there is no anxiety. And that's kind of like where my mind is coming back to on this right now is if you live in the now, then then there is no question of the best. Hmm. Okay. I love that. And I, I think that someone in this room, I'm not pointing any fingers because I don't know, but we have like a lot of really well-read people in here. And I'm just thinking that we have like something in us that's hardwired in our like human fa- fabric that makes us believe we have to have like some rubric or some table. And maybe prehistorically back in the day, it was, I lived or I died. And that was the rubric. It was as simple as that. But like, what is it? Is there something that is already like woven in us where we think we have to quantify this? Hmm. Well, I think part of it is, I'm going to take a stab at this. From a from the direction of like hierarchies, because the tribe growing like from an evolutionary standpoint was very hierarch- hierarchical. So if you're at the top of the hierarchy, you get all the the best mates, you get all the food, you get all the best sleeping and safety and all the things, right? And if you're lower down on the hierarchy, then you aren't doing as great. And there was no like objective measure, obviously, for our prehistoric ancestors. They just they kind of knew where they were because they were such a tight knit little community and they didn't necessarily have ways of communicating who's the best and not the best and these different parameters that it was just kind of like interwoven. You knew, you knew really accurately where you were on the totem pole based on that. Like animals are the same way. You look at pack animals like wolves, they all know where they are. They don't have a system of ranking, but they know where they rank. And then 
maybe as we became more sophisticated and civilization evolved and we started, you know, living in large groups like cities, now it's very, very difficult to look over and be like, well, how am I objectively, where am I in the ranking? I don't know anymore. When it was only 15 of us, I knew I was number seven. Now there's 15 million of us. Where am I? So now we have to find artificial ways of measuring that like money or, or fitness or, you know, like looks. And so we start to create these more objective things where we're like, well, I'm really good at this and this and this, and therefore I'm up, I'm up here. That makes a lot of sense to me. Like I can actually say like, okay, I can see how that plays out, but that's my voice. <laughs> as soon as Anthony was saying that I pictured, um, this happens a lot. And I think I read in a book, it might not be gender specific, but I think the book I was talking about says how women do this a lot where we enter a room and we find like our hierarchical status, like yep. who's making the most money, who's the prettiest, who's the most fit, who's got the best kids, the best husband. Like we go in, we instantly start analyzing. And that's one of the debilitating things I think about women and our relationship with other women right now that we want to try to mend and heal. We can come together and grow together. But we are still doing that, even though now we might be competing, especially with the digital era, with everyone in our state, in our country or in the world. Now we're trying to be the best author, not just out of our town, but out of our country or the world. <laughs> we're all competing. Um, but I still think to rudimentary level, we are still doing that every time we enter a room or a Zoom chat or a book club, we just kind of all of a sudden like analyze, wait, where am I at? <laughs> and Monica, you just nailed something there that's like super important, which is as like the tribe has expanded and now our ability to see what everybody's doing on social media across the globe, we're no longer comparing ourselves to who's the best in our little tri-state area or our town. We're now looking at who's the best in the world. And that's mm -hmm. that's the best out of like 7 billion people. That's, that's an un imaginably higher standard that we're trying to measure ourselves against and it's super unhealthy because obviously there can only ever be one person at that top, top, top pinnacle. If you're not yeah. Jeff Bezos, you'll never be the richest. If you're, you know, if you're not uh, Michael Phelps, you'll never be the best swimmer. And so if that's your metric, then of course, you're always going to be dissatisfied and frustrated. But if, if you were to bring that back down, you're like, I'm actually the best swimmer in my neighborhood. That's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> but if that's all I knew was my neighborhood, then I would be happy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got a story I want to tell really quick that is an example of this, but it also I think it shows the duality. This just reminded me back in middle school, I was playing in orchestra and they had two sections of violin. And in my section, I had first chair. So I was kind of this like trying to be the best in my section. But honestly, I was not competitive. I didn't really care about this class very much. So I was first chair, but I wasn't really doing my best to be there. I didn't have to do my best to be the best in that section. And it took the pressure of trying to be the best violin player in all of orchestra because in the other violin section, there were the two Amy's. Amy and Amy had been playing since third freaking grade. I'm never going to play like that when I'm first learning. So that took all the pressure off of being the best. And then being the best of my section or being first chair of my section gave me an additional boost of confidence. But the, the girl next to me, Amber, she would challenge me every class to get my chair. And I never did homework. I never practiced. The only time I practiced would she when she would challenge me for my chair. And I would do just enough to beat her out to keep my chair. She only got my chair twice and I got it back the next day. But in all of this comparison mode, I honestly wasn't doing my best. And I found my place to be the best and be comfortable. But I also knew I was never going to beat the Amy's. Those are like, you know, the Tony Robbins of the violin class of the orchestra <laughs> class. <laughs> this, this reminds me, I, I think a big part of this conversation is the fact that society has ingrained us to that so much of the definition of the best is externally granted. Like mm. somebody decided you were chair number one. You didn't decide that. And Amber didn't decide that. You guys didn't have a conversation and be like, you're number one. And even in that situation, that's still externally granted to a, to a degree. And I think that's where the problems really come in is when we're looking for external validation for our place in the hierarchy, rather than saying, hey, I did my best. I, I, the performance might not have shown it, but I did my best. And I know, I know that's, that's good enough for me. I think a common theme here also is when you look at what happens, the byproduct of trying to be the best 
I was talking about that with this, with my family at dinner last night. And I'm like the mindset difference. It's like black and white. It's like totally opposite. They're just completely opposed to each other because when you're trying to be the best, you're competitive and you're defensive and you're aggressive and you're like, there's an end goal and that's where you can get, there's a limitation. It's like you're, once you're the best, you can't go beyond being the best because you've already arrived. So there's a destination. There's a lot more to that, you know, that we could go into. But then when you look at if I'm doing my best, now I have a growth mindset. It's positive. I can collaborate with other people. I can, um, I'm no longer in a negative position where it's like, oh, well, we're podcasters. I, my podcast is better than your podcast. Yeah. You know, I don't have to even be judging my, um, my podcast or anything based off of anyone else's metrics. I can simply be looking and saying, am I showing up and doing my best? And I can go out and ask those other podcasters and say, you know, Hey, what are you doing? Or I can ask other investors, whatever it is, there's collaboration that happens because we're no longer isolated. And I thought that that was a very interesting, for me, it was a very interesting distinction between being the best and then yeah, J- Jeff Bezos. I mean, like he can fall. You think back um, in history, Andrew Carnegie or Carnegie, I guess is the correct pronunciation, but right. He was the richest man in the world. And then what JP Morgan passes him up, well, you know, they're always bat- rivaling each other for who's going to be the richest man in the world mm-hmm. instead of simply like, a ridiculous amount of money and whatever, you know, it's, it's an interesting position. And, and Austin, you've been really quiet. Abnormally quiet. <laughs> uh, I th- there's a couple of things here. I think this is why I position my, my goals and my, just my lifestyle around uh, a lifestyle. Like, Real estate doesn't have a metric to me. It's something that is a vehicle to create freedom. Working out is not a PR number I'm trying to get to. I do it every day because I'm a healthy person. Travel is something that gives me everything that I believe in. So I do it all the time. There's not a number or a thing. I just started this morning, Simon Sinek's Infinite Game. Mm-hmm. It's an entire mind shift on the way you look at everything. And so if if my... As you're talking and these things are happening, my my number one why in the world is to lift up everybody around me and create impact at every turn. So the question is, is tell me when I can be done. It doesn't happen. So then I have infinite amount of energy to continue my thing, no matter the seas, no matter the storms, no matter what's going on. One of the things, the woman I was talking about that I talked to you yesterday about, this amazing conversation I had, the number one thing that she's going to write a book on is how to tell high achievers that when you turn off your flame, you can turn it back on. Mm. Everybody thinks <laughs> wow. that everybody thinks that when you shut it down or you start over your life or you get divorced like I did, or you or you lose money in a business, that you're starting back from where you started back way down there. No, no, you, you gained, you growed. But that's not mm. what we think in our mind. And so we need to create more of a lifestyle type of thinking and, and impact on a bigger scale than these little metrics. Uh, because ultimately, you're never going to get there. The to-do list, the, all these things are never going to get there. But who am I becoming in the process? And that's what we harp on is so much more important. So, yeah, your growth in doing your best and your personal growth takes you out of that competition. Everything that you just said, Austin, was like not competitive, not competitive, more self-focused. And I think that's the biggest distinction here is because when we're worried or we're doing our best, this allows us to take action wherever we are, where any moment to work with what we've got and to consistently grow. But the second that our, our focus is on being the best, it's then paralyzing. It can be derailing and it's just disturbing your own intuition, your own creativity, your own why and path is then being modeled, modeled and molded by other people, what they're doing, society's expectations. And one of the things that I run into a lot when working with my clients is they're trying to follow these trends and serve the market with what they need yes. and chase the market instead of Austin's like laughing. Well, like crazy. No, I'm <laughs> laughing. I'm, la- I'm laughing because Mark, who's my digital guy and rebuilding my website right now, says that 90% of the time he's not a digital marketer. He's a life coach. Yes. <laughs> 
<laughs> it's the truth because you're me and Anthony talk about this all the time. Stop. You can you can take something from somebody, but don't don't yeah. don't do exactly what they're doing because it's not you. You know how many people mm-hmm. have told me, you know, your coaching systems need to be like this and you need to create mm-hmm. this. And I'm like, every time it feels so uh, unnatural, I don't even <laughs> want to do it anymore. So you've taken the thing that I love the most about it, which is energy and exchange of energy and just my people find me. And then you now you've created this box that I can't operate in. Mm. Oh my gosh. This just completely unearthed something new on this whole concept for me. And, and that is like the depth of it goes into when we are trying to do our best, how each of us is uniquely, you know, created and hardwired can shine. Like you, we all have different skills and talents and perspectives and everything. And when we are putting the emphasis on like, just do your best. Now I have permission to show up and I can just be Julie. (laughs) Who's Which Julie are you going to get today? No, I'm kidding. (laughs) You know, but it's like, I can just be me and know that it's safe. And that brings that creativity. You mentioned Monica, something about like, just that creativity can grow and flourish. And the moment Mm -hmm. you're trying to, fit into somebody else's package and you're going to be competitive and I'm going to, I'm going to outrank them on whatever it is. Like you just shut you off. What makes you unique and and special? I have to take it from here, Julie. That's entirely why I had named my podcast on authentic because you can turn it on and off. It's turned on and off, but our authenticity is essentially our unique selling proposition, our our unique selling point that we're bringing. And when I first started my work, like over around four years ago, I thought I was making cool logos and designs that I was, you know, trying to create just something that looked good aesthetically. And when I start working with my clients, trying to find out their personality and what they like, they start bringing me other people's stuff because that can inspire us, but they're bringing them to me as like a competition. So I'll do, here's like your competitor list, but here's just an inspiration list. I have them break it out. But um, in doing this work, I started off just just giving a service. But like Austin said, I feel like I'm becoming more and more of this coach. So I'm now calling it like a branding coach or consultant because we're uncovering the layers of them and their authenticity, what really makes them unique. Because there's so many times where my clients start trying to follow this trend and be something they're not in order to market their business. And then that passion dies. And it seems like they always hit a wall and that success and failure line, like they keep falling on the failure line when they're not truly aligned and using their own skills in their own way. I had this woman who has a huge following on Instagram. She comes on and we're building her a blogging website and she hates writing. I finished that client, but this was like the hardest client. To do. I had to write her website copy and she was finding a friend to write it for her. But like that was her natural, what she needed to do to take her business thing to the next level. And I just knew it was inauthentic. I tried to coach her. I did my best. Some people are just stuck there, but that's turned into more of my job. And in doing this work, I in doing this field with helping entrepreneurs, speakers and authors, my pitch or my my whole point is to help them become incomparable in their field with their personal brand and an experiential website. But <laughs> I feel I've just discovered after a few years of just doing the art and logo part that we've been raised by a world that's requiring us to conform, to survive, and to, com- to compete to succeed. And they struggle. And that's what I struggled with in my authenticity and trying to grow my business. All my clients are just so confused about what they want or need in their brand or their business to be their best because they're comparing themselves to others. Mm -hmm. So much of what you guys, what somebody does in the (laughs) digital market. Yeah, that's, that's, that's good. Um, So much of, you know, when Austin's talking about Mark and Monica dealing with your clients is like digital marketing. It's people come in expecting that to be the thing that helps amplify their voice. Cause that's really what Mm -hmm. these things are is an amplification of the voice. But the problem is most people don't know what their voice is. Mm -hmm. And so they're they're like, well, that's a sound I hear from over there. Let's amplify that thing. It's like, but that's not your, that's not your voice. That's just a recording of somebody else's voice. 
for me, mm-hmm. you know, going back, Monica, when you mentioned like competition and personal development and growth and like, for me, this, this hits very close to home because I'm, a, I'm an incredibly competitive person. And I haven't told this story on this podcast in a long time, but I'll, I'll make it up to you guys because I'm going to um, retread some ground, but I'll, I'll tell you a part that I haven't told people. And so when I was like 12 or 13, I won the South Dakota state chess championship and my dad wasn't there, right? He dropped me off at the event. He came and picked me up afterwards. And he asked me the question afterwards of how did you do? And I said, I won. And he said, good, you were supposed to. And that was like a real pivotal definitive moment in my life where from that moment forward, everything that I did, it was expected that I was, I was going to win. And so, you know, I went and, and did a lot of things with my life, but it was always achieving without fulfillment. And Tony Robbins says achievement without fulfillment is the ultimate failure. And I think that's ab- absolutely true because when you're, when you're expected to just always be the best, then you're, you're never going to find satisfaction because you can only ever like fall short of that. Uh, at best, you just achieve the thing that you're supposed to do, but then you're, you're left empty anyway. And so the part of this that I want to share that I haven't shared before is like to this day, like I've, I would say in the last decade, I've started to figure out how to like in- change that internal narrative. But my my voice that's inside of my head that when I'm like in the shower and it's just real quiet and the voice that keeps coming back to my head, it always says, I don't know if you guys do this, but you like your mind like circles through what you imagine other people are saying about you. And like, for whatever reason, my mind is fixated on like what other people think about me. And one of the things that when I'm in the shower, like the voice that I hear them saying is like, oh, he's the best. That's, that's the recurring dialogue that goes in my head is like this expectation of like, oh, he's the best. I'm like, but what's that even mean? You know, like I catch it now and I'm like, I look at it. I'm like, that's just such an empty, weird thing to think. But it, it like, it's, it's so ingrained in my brain right now that it's like, it's always there still. But, but on the surface, just knowing you and spending this time that I do with together, it's indefinable. Because you have such a curiosity for learning and growing that will never be able to hit that target for you. Because I I actually think that you're one of the people that champion growth and knowledge more than anybody I've ever met. So you're always becoming your best. So actually, to be honest with you, every day you are your best as you show up for today. Yeah. And that's the whole impetus behind the plus one better every day, right? Mm -hmm. Is just, we're not looking for best. We're just looking for better. And -hmm. if we can just look for this, like a little bit of growth and better can be however you want to define it. doesn't like, I'm all about incremental marginal improvement. And if you can find satisfaction in that little bit of motion forward, because that's at the end of the day, that's what it's really about is progress, some kind of progress. That's what humans really need. Like we're either moving forward or we're moving backwards. We're not doing static. Static never works. And so mm-hmm. you have to find fulfillment, I think, in the progress forward. But the problem then, I think, Julie, we were talking about this before the show is like, we look at the people in our community, our circles, and we're like, man, they're progressing so much faster and further and doing so much more. I need to go and do more when really you just need to take a step back and look at it and say, what's the amount of progress that is enough for me. Like, what is my best? And what does that represent on a, on a daily basis? Like that could just be a single step forward. You know, it's not running a mile every day. It could just be a single step. I, I have, to, go ahead. Well, I was, I was going to add uh, two totally different nuggets, but on that note, you know, it's interesting when you look at, um, I was, you know, had a meeting with one of my partners and she, you know, was talking about um, how she was looking at another, another person in our niche. And she's like, wow, you know, look at all the things she's accomplishing. And I said, you do understand, you know, you have like a hundred kids and I have kids and we have a career, you know, like you just look at, <laughs> I'm using a hundred because she has a larger family yeah. and, and I'm not going to be specific, but like, when you look at your life circumstances and what is it that I, I, I asked her, I kind of called her to test say like, what is it? I mean, like, we can always grow and do these other things later, but we can't go back mm-hmm. in time. And, mm-hmm. and it doesn't even have to be for parents out there. It can be whatever it is. So like, you know, 
Anthony, you're in this position where you're doing really cool things with your business and you're empowering other people to expand their businesses in really, really healthy, powerful ways, right? And, um, you know, Austin, you're doing this crazy, amazing growth and coaching people. Like, we're all doing these things that are empowering the people around us, like pouring in. So it's not isolated to, oh, well, you have children, so therefore you have this higher purpose. It isn't like that. It's if you're living into your current purpose, wherever you are, that might mean we're no longer valuing, say, oh, you know, in the real estate, oh, well, I just closed this many units. Well, that's great. You close that many units. You know, I, you know, are you pouring into other parts of your life? And those things are going to shift and change and to accept that. And I think acceptance, that's like my word for this year. I think that's mm. one of those powerful things that we have to say, just because I'm not... I'm doing my best. It might not be reflected in some of these areas that I value, but right now, this particular area needs my full attention or needs my more focused, concerted efforts. Julie, how many times do you think we've talked over the last like four months? If you just had to guess, podcast, conversations, all this stuff. I don't know. Like I have no idea. I, I have I, like, I, I have no idea what you do for a living. Nor, do, <laughs> nor, do, nor, nor and my point, my point by this is do I care? Who mm-hmm. you are in your business or what you're working towards doesn't define my relationship with you. Who you are as a person and as a mom and as a friend to me matters way more. And if we could get back to a society where that's the case, what what do we do when we go to a party? What do you do? Hey, what do you do? How many units do you have? Who gives a shit? Who <laughs> gives a fuck? It doesn't change who you are. If you're making a million dollars a month and you're a shitty husband and a shitty father, I don't want to hear from you. We need to we need to regroup the conversation to who are you are as a person? What do you stand for? Like what do you do every day? Like meaning, like, do you show up for your kids? Do you show up for yourself? Do you work out? Do you eat good? Do you leave an impact? That doesn't matter. It's the same thing as this stupid thing where how are you doing? Well, I'm busy. Fuck you. Everybody's oh, busy. Oh gosh, busy. <laughs> like, let's move, let's move on past it. I can't stand the unit count and I can't stand I'm busy. I don't want to hear it. It doesn't matter oh, to me. But but this is gonna go even deeper into a mindset issue because you know, and I'm not going, I'm not sure. saying I'm judging anyone, but I'm just saying, like, if I look at some of the content that's out there. You have some people that are creating content that highlights their business success. And then you have people creating content that highlights their physical achievements or their achievements within their family. Or so I think it really comes down to like a deeper internal position for people to really release like, I'm accepted just as I am because I'm me and I do my best. If it's 1% better every day, great. <laughs> if it's a, a 0.01% better every day, I still did better. <laughs> I won't lie, that might be me some days. <laughs> and I think what Julie and Austin just made a point on, again, is these metrics that we use to establish or find where we're at within the pack like Anthony was talking about. So we go in the party and we ask, well, what do you do? Especially if you're in a networking group and you're with other people who are in your same industry, you're finding your pecking order. But not only that, I'm seeing it as a trying to establish like, where's your best, where should you be? And start like doing that self-defeating comparison mode within yourself. Should I be pushing harder? Like, where should I be? And I think um, one of my episodes, I just talked about how our age can affect how people (laughs) interact with us within our businesses. And it's kind of the same metrics. And with what Julie's saying, whether you're fitness industry or in a business industry, you're using these metrics to establish. But I think sometimes when done genuinely and authentically, these metrics can be used in a way to inspire others, maybe to not be thinking limiting by creating their own ceilings, by opening up what the next level of what their best could be or what's even possible for them. Okay, that begs a big question then, because I'm all about, I'm very active, we know, on social media and everything. And in any post that I post, I always have what I call like a heart check. It's like, if it's Mm -hmm. not 
if it's not authentic, then yep. it's not authentic and it's not going to get posted <laughs> done. Right. So, so, but how many people do that? But I can't control who's receiving that and how they're receiving it. So it could be postured to like encourage and inspire, but now somebody's seeing it as, um, you know, because their mindset is still like the best. So what do we do as, cause we are all content creators. Like what do we do as content creators to help um, level up that mindset? So, you know, so it can be the best. I'm kidding. Whoa. I got Sorry. one. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. I, I think instantly we need to put it in context because most of the time when I'm seeing these amazing numbers, it's not in the context of how many months and weeks have they been working on this? How many years have they been in this industry working up to it? When we don't have the context, then it just slices away um, and creates that comparison mode because then I'm comparing, comparing my life to then their life. And like Julie's got kids and family and I don't. So I cannot compare our contexts the same, even if we're trying to do the same thing. So I think context would be the number one to help include. But I'm afraid of saying my numbers honestly as well with people online. When I tell people, which I don't usually, <laughs> that when I started freelance graphic design, it only took five months for me to quit my corporate office job. But then I added the context of, but at the time, my rent was $300. So like, hello, how much easier is that than compared to your $2,000 a month mortgage, your family of kids and your car payments? Mm -hmm. So I think the context helps. Yeah, the context is everything. When we you hear people say, don't compare your page one to somebody else's page 52 mm -hmm. or chapter whatever. And I hate that saying because it presumes that we have the same book. And we don't, we ah. have entirely different books. And so it's like, why would you, it's like trying to compare the great Gatsby to Moby Dick. It's like, that's a pointless comparison to make. And the issue that I have with, the, we only ever put out our best selves on social media. Like we're only ever celebrating our successes. Generally people, what you see from everybody and like, cause they're trying to build a brand around like success. And like, that's somebody I want to work with. And so they're not going to lead with all their failures and only show you failures and never show you any kind of successes. But the problem is those successes, like Monica's pointing out, it's like sh so shrouded and dependent on the context. So things like, Oh, I'm 22 and financially free after I acquired 300 units. It's like, yeah, but you live with your parents. Like that's that's pretty <laughs> disingenuous, don't you think? Like that's not quite the same thing as being financially free. That's just living with your. I I was financially free then, but based on that, like <laughs> that's not that's a, you know. But that in our sphere where it's like, oh, last year I closed in my first year I closed three hundred units and blah blah blah. It's like, well, you capital raised and you own point one percent of those deals, and so it's like is that quite the same as if you were actively managing the portfolio of like single family rentals and you bought three of them and you're working a full-time job and you have kids. It's like, no, they're not the same thing at all. But like, we look at the, the one and we're like, wow, 20 million of assets under management. It's like, we're impressed by that. Some like, I'm not impressed by that, but generally that's what we're putting that message out there so that people will be impressed and go, Oh, that's where they are in the pecking order. I must be below that. Hmm. So just like business, you need to live your life in the net, not the gross. There's a, there's a million of wholesalers because I've seen the inside of the businesses and Airbnb people because I coach these people. Man, I did 200K in gross. Yeah, but your margin is 3%. <laughs> yep. Hey, I have 76 units of Airbnb, but I'm only making 4,000 bucks a month. Oh, that doesn't make sense. Live your life in the net, not the gross. If you own a 50 unit and you own it by yourself, then you're making way more money than somebody who's invested in a thousand units. You know, we, we need to make sure that we're being authentic with who we are. And one of the ways to do that, something that me, that, that I love to do is I meet people where they are with my brand and with myself. So, you know, one of the number one things, because I worked in hospitality for 20 plus years, one of the number one things that I fucking hated is when my bosses would come up to me and go, hey, there's a VIP on table 26, make sure they get the best service. Mm. Well, well, no. What do you mean? No. Well, everybody gets the best service. Doesn't matter. You're the president. You're the janitor. You're getting the best version of myself at all times. There's no... Nothing changes in that moment. 
And that's how I've always lived my life. You never make anybody feel smaller. You always lift up somebody else. And, you know, even if you are the smartest guy in the room, you don't need to show it out. You actually need to be more humble in your approach. And if you live by these things, then you're going to, you're going to operate, be able to operate whatever you are. I think in that humility too, we can meet our goals and accomplish what we're trying to achieve by showing up as being more successful or further along than we are. That is actually, we think that's what's going to get us to our goal of making great connections with getting more investing partners, with getting more clients, but it's actually not. We, we feel like we prove the success, but instead, like Austin said, just being humility, meeting people where they are and being yourself is going to do that. But it's a little bit scarier. It's a little bit more risky because then you're personally tied to that. You're you're being yourself. So you feel like you're under scrutiny a little bit more, I think, too. So people might use it as a protective barrier. This begs to the question. Your authentic self might be different for different environments. Oh, yeah. So So <laughs> what I mean by that is like people see me and they meet me and they're like, Oh my God, dude, you must be like biting metal and you're spitting fire when we meet you in person. And I'm like, no, I'm pretty chill. And and so it's like, there's different parts of who we are that show up in different ways. But as long as you're comfortable in the true definition and rooted of who you are, then, then there's different scenarios for different things. You know, I can't make it through an episode of the brain dump without a car analogy. So <laughs> <laughs> <Let's hear it. laughs> and it's funny i don't even like cars all that much. Yeah, that's, what, that's what cracks me up the most you don't even like cars <laughs> anthony's the non-car guy car guy exactly yeah i grew up on I love that that's and always, improvement <laughs> that's always part of the conversation also like if this is always like it's a segment it's a, <laughs> it's a, it's a thing segment. now but but you know when when austin's talking about that it's it, we had this first came up in our conversation with um angelo and and rick alexander where y- you know the vehicle is going to be different. You're going to show up in different vehicles at different places in your life. Sometimes it's right to take the bicycle. Sometimes it's right to take the Prius. Sometimes you show up in the Ferrari, but the the thing that doesn't change is the driver. And that's you. That's the authentic self that's driving the vehicle. The problem is when people are driving vehicles to try and mask what's inside, like I'm showing up in the Ferrari to the grocery store. It's like, well, what's the, what's the impetus there? Like, or, you know, understanding what's the motivation and choosing the vehicle. That's the important thing that sometimes we get wrong. Like we're on social media, we're choosing this vehicle that like casts us in the best light because we think that's what people want to see and hear from. And as Monica points out, it's not really, it's not really what helps people connect with you. Like sure. People might follow you and look up and be like, wow, that guy's got it all together. Like we might follow Grant Cardone, but I don't really want to be friends with Grant Cardone. I don't really want to work with Grant Cardone at all. (laughs) So it's like, you, you you get you get the one thing, but you're really losing out on the thing that you wanted, which was connection and meaningful engagement. Mm. Mm. To so. to build on Anthony's analogy, this one we'll take this one to maybe the kid level. <laughs> so it's like <laughs> Mr. Potato Head. We believe that we have a specific personality. And that to be authentic, that we need to keep that personality in different rooms and environments. And that's actually being inauthentic. Like Julie would say, it's it's kind of putting ourselves in a box. So if we are like Mr. Potato Head, we have all different types of hats, mustaches, glasses, lips that go inside of us that are always living inside of us. And then we decide with our persona what we're going to bring out and be in that moment, essentially. But it's all inside of us. And now if we start trying to take off Grant Cardone's hat and wear it, like that didn't come from inside of us and now we're no longer authentic. But we have a lot of different personas in one body. Julie, you can see I'm, why Julie, I was like, Julie, I know you're Julie, going to like Monica. <laughs> Julie, great guest. I mean, seriously, I don't even yeah, know. Yeah, I love that say. analogy. That's so good. So, so good. good. You just crushed it. Seriously. So Monica. whatever you're putting on, make sure it came out of your Mr. Potato Head and not someone else's Mr. Potato Head. <laughs> well, and I think this Especially is in COVID times. That might be a dream. Or your car. Is Potato this a car hat. in your garage or did you just steal the Ferrari? There you go. Yeah. <laughs> but, and I think that this is something 
particular personalities might need to work through more than others. So for me, being more of an effervescent, energetic, you know, personality, I remember in my late teens, early 20s, having to go through this growth process where people expected me to show up all the time as happy Julie. It's like, Julie's always happy. She's always like encouraging and like always happy. And it's like, um, do you ever think that maybe I need a quiet moment or like, so if I was like at work where people I'd rock climb with the group, you know, the people I worked with, we, we work together, we play together. And it's like the pressure to always be something. And it's like, I had to learn to say, um, I have bad days too. I can be sad or I can be thoughtful and I can be reflective. Like these are important things. Like you're not always on and you're and I'm not a performer for someone and you're always going to get the real me every single time you see me so you know accept that right now but you have to personally accept I'm going back to Mr. Potato Head because that is like the best That's analogy ever yeah. Monica so it's like I have <laughs> so it all good. in me and so you know you're it's not being someone that I'm not and really if we're all you know authentically ourselves we're, we're going to unpack those different parts. This we should wear is, all the outfits inside of us. Well, <gasps> this, this, there you go. This is the problem with getting sober. Mm. Is showing up in the rooms with the people that have known you forever. And you know what they say to me? Whether or not they, they think it's the right thing to say, I like heavy Austin better. Mm. Who says that to somebody? Like, fuck you. Like, and well, you know what I tell everybody that wants to get sober, if your friends and family or your spouse or your mom or dad don't champion this, fuck them. Who can be upset with you trying to better yourself? Who can be upset? And as Anthony mentioned in a previous podcast, you can set a goal. I'm going to be sober for 30 days. But if your identity of who you are is still an alcoholic, mm -hmm. then you're an alcoholic. It's a shift. And it can transcend into anything besides alcoholism. Like it's mm -hmm. whatever you're identifying with that inner identity. I just, I just interviewed this guy who's a high level coach. You know what he said to me? He goes, the true addiction to America is victim mentality. That's the true addiction. Mm. It's the, it's, they yeah. said it's worse than alcohol. They said it's worse than crack cocaine because the, 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 the dialogue that you're having within your head can't beat it don't you tell me to wrap up my own podcast <laughs> dude i am the mayor of the traffic i know what's going on i got the time okay. <laughs> I got the next time it's all good. yeah uh, excuse Austin, me and, excuse me hey talkers. listen we have we have our new best our new julie our new julie ambassador. just called in the question austin's personality or persona there he's like wait a minute <laughs> Do we have our new ambassador right there, Monica? You can get out of here. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just joking. I'm just joking. Aww. No, listen. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Listen, guys, I will wrap it up because I could go forever. So, so we need to have another podcast on the victim. We, need to, we do need to have another podcast. Mm -hmm. Monica, you're coming on mine. You're amazing. I can't wait. Uh, but uh, but Monica, if people want to find out more about what you got going on, follow your journey, how would they do that? Probably the easiest way to find me would be at onthentic.com. O N authentic.com that links to my design work monica fawn design but then that links to my podcast and all the new content and um someday eventually my site template site shop that i'll be creating as well so on authentic.com links to everywhere mm. that's a good move i like the template thing uh miss <laughs> miss holly uh who's cut me oh, off oh gosh uh, i don't I even get a first name anymore <laughs> i just have to go on record i was like i didn't mean like we had to like shut it down no, like this. I'm just, i was like I'm just oh, kidding. I should probably just, I, I checked the time. I'm like, oh, book club starting. I got to get out, out to that. Um, You know what? Monica created this amazing website and she, for me, and she put all of, all of who I am, because just like you said, Austin, like I'm not just any one thing. I'm not just an investor. I do a whole lot of things. So if you head to julieholly.com, you can find all of the things that make me Julie and, um, awesome best books reading list, which would be very relevant to this group, um, you know, the audience and you awesome listeners, because it's just a list of really great books. And if you have really great books um, that you think that I should add to my list, I always want to know about that. So you can contact me that way. Wonderful. Anthony, what's the homework for the audience today? 
think the homework today is to go into your Mr. Potato. Oh, so Julie and Monica have homework too. So you're going to get a lot of homework today, people. Yeah. You- Sorry, guys. It's cram session. Here, here I'll talk. I'll talk fast. I'll talk fast so you guys can give your homework. So go into your Mr. Potato Head uh, inventory of all your, all the things that are inside of you and just take them out, put them on the floor, look at them and see what are all those outfits. Because a lot of times, like when Austin's talking about being an alcoholic and getting sober, they're like, oh, a lot of, a lot of the resistance is that people have never seen you wear that outfit before. And so they assume it's not yours. And so at a certain point when you've gone so long without wearing it, people go, oh, that's weird on you. I don't, I've never seen this. So just pull it out because you might be surprised what you find in there. Take a look at it and say, okay. Why am I choosing not to wear that one? Maybe it's not the right season. That's okay. But if you're if you're shying away from it because it makes you uncomfortable, it's like, hey, this is uh, this is the summer. You know, if you're not comfortable in the short shorts, like that's okay. But like, let's take a look at that because it's the skeletons in the closet that we don't acknowledge that are always the scariest. Oh my gosh, I have to give my homework next because that is so in unison. So my my homework is to put something on that you haven't worn. So now that you have the inventory laid out, choose something that you haven't worn and put on the glasses, put on the hat, put something on the scarf, just find something and try it out because it's you, it's part of you. And you're going to discover something else about yourself. Monica, are you adding to this? (laughs) Well, I didn't really have homework. I had just a closing thought, but to elaborate on Julie's to fully explore ourselves. Yes. Try something that you've never done before. Uh, different sets of clothing, home decor, because sometimes we limit ourselves with what goes into our Mr. Potato Head that something else might fit in there, but we're not allowing to because we're not exploring. We're just too set Mm. in what's in. So evaluate what's in the Mr. Potato Head and then try on something new. Sounds like the homework, but my closing thought, I ran into a quote before we talked um, from Michael Beckwith, and it really inspired a thought that I think kind of wraps up our, our traction that we made today. And I think that we believe our happiness and success comes with being the best, that achievement. And Anthony said it so good, that achievement without fulfillment. I mean, that's a disaster. But after a while, we realize our joy is really in becoming ourselves in activating our potential, not meeting or exceeding someone else's potential. And that's all I had. (laughs) <laughs> Love it. Well, I got to say something because I'm not going to be the only one to say something, but I pull, I pulled this up when we first talked. Uh, Mr. Rick Alexander, who's one of my favorite humans in the world, has this quote, you can't possibly perform at your best while simultaneously beating yourself for not performing at your best. Boom. <laughs> That's the thing. Guys, we really appreciate y'all listening. If you got value from this episode. The, 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 fi- the fi- final line right here. We got one minute left. So make a quick Austin. Go. Wrap us up. Get us Bye. out of here. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was doing, but it's okay. I just this wanted to jump happened. on the bandwagon. I just this is to what jump happens on the back, when right? we don't have a lot of conversations. You start treating me like I'm a crazy ex-girlfriend. I'm not okay with this. Austin, All right. Bye, guys. Go. Stop. Go. Stop, Austin. Go. <laughs> Thanks for joining us here at The Brain Dump. Now, before you go, it's important to solidify what you've learned here today by taking action. If all you do is listen, then you're only going to retain a small amount of the information you consumed here today. So take a quick moment to really lock in any key insights, tidbits, or pieces of wisdom that you want to carry with you into the future. You can do this by heading over to iTunes and leaving a review with your top three takeaways from this episode. If you've already left a review, first, thank you so much. Second, it's time to start a brain dump journal. It doesn't have to be fancy, just a slip of paper will do where you can record a couple quick thoughts from each episode. Science shows this is one of the best ways to ensure long-term retention of new information. And finally, if you've got a brother, a sister, a co-worker, or a best friend that you think would benefit from this episode, do them and us a favor and share with them this episode. Your support, as always, means the world to us.